This section of the Clark Tour will be in our upholstery building. The first section that you come to in the upholstery building is where we do all our die cutting. We've got shelves here that are full of dies, mainly for doing upholstery. So each section of upholstery is cut with a steel rule die and is exactly the same each time. So what's a steel rule die? Uh, we've got steel rule dies for almost all the gaskets. We cut all our gaskets fresh ourselves, that way we can use the best materials and we know that they're fresh. Here Tim's going to demonstrate cutting out the carburetor top gasket. And there's the gasket after it's all punched out. Most carburetor gasket sets that are on the market use a blotter type material. The material we use for the gaskets costs three or four times more, but it's a much better quality and doesn't allow the gas to seep through. This is a power glide gasket and is one of our most intricate ones. This is the back side of the tooling with punches and the steel rule die. And on this side you can make out the holes. The steel rule die is harder to make out. And the reason there's all this foam is that helps to eject the gasket from the tooling. So just what is a steel rule die? A steel rule die is made by taking a piece of special plywood. You have to cut the pattern exactly the way you want it. And then a special very, very sharp steel rule is put in and this will actually do the cutting. This is our largest steel rule gasket cutting machine. This one we use more for carpets, package areas, anything that's really large. In this case he's cutting out an early package area and would have to make three cuts across as he moved the tooling. Once we leave the die cutting section, we go into the main upholstery section of the building. We'll take a quick look around first and then we'll go back and look at some of the actual items that they're making. In this building we've got the thread, we've got the binding, we've got the various vinyls. We've got five or six sewing machines, different sewing machines for doing different items. We still have a limited amount of the original fabric material for the 500s and 700s. Back in this section is where we do our carpets. So there's rolls of carpet material. The carpets actually get cut on this table. Then they have to get sewn and then the padding glued on. And you'll notice there's rolls of vinyl on the wall. This is the correct way to store vinyl so that you don't put pleats in it. So all of our four or five hundred rolls of vinyl and headliner are all stored like this rather than just being laid on top of each other. Some of the items that we don't sell as many of, we do hand cut those. This would normally be for 500s and 700s where we might sell two or three a year. My father started the upholstery division for us in the mid 80s and when he took each section of upholstery apart he very carefully diagrammed the different types of stitching, the different types of pleating. So this is a diagram just for a bucket seat bottom. And you can see there's a tremendous amount of detail in this. But we wanted to make sure that we could always make items just as accurately as we could to the way they left the factory. This is a completed set of 1964 bucket seats that Donna just finished sewing. These are the pieces that she would get that Tim has die cut for her. The pleats, we'll see how the pleats were made in just a minute. And now she'll be sewing the pieces together. 
1963. Some of the sections are much harder than others to sew together. You're going through belt, vinyl, listing. She will then have to add the correct bindings that go around. This is the beading or piping that is used on the pieces of interior. You'll notice that it's notched. The notching allows it to go around the corners when they're sewing it without bunching. Pearl just finished sewing in a piece of cardboard, something that you normally don't even know exists in the bucket seat. About the only time you see it is while you're actually installing it. So each bucket seat starts off with all these different pieces that all have to go together in the right sequence, the right materials, light, right listings, bindings, everything according to our diagrams. So Pearl had pieces over here for the bucket seat, but that's not everything. There's even more pieces for the bucket seat. Really a fairly time-consuming project in order to make your seats just the way they were when they left the factory. If you have a convertible, you probably have or need one of these. This is a top boot before it's sewn all together. There's vinyl, there's a special stiffener material, there's plastic, and what you don't even see here yet are all the snaps that have to be included and the special rivets that we use. Pearl's going to tell us what's so difficult about doing a top boot. Okay, when we're doing a top boot on this seam right here, we are doing it on this side, we're sewing it on this side, but we have to make sure it goes right around this seam here. So it's difficult. You have to keep it even. Then on this last piece here, you're sewing it from this side, going all the way around, going around here, and it's got to be, this is the back side of it. You've got to keep it even. So it is difficult. It's a blind stitch. And then down here you can see we've got the original rivets and we've got the original plastic material that slides into the back of your seat. When you get out to the edge they're going through almost a quarter of an inch of plastic and vinyl and filler and it's going through an attachment that puts this finished binding all the way around it and at the same time they're in putting the snaps in. So it's really a, a very difficult project. If you saw the video in Building 3, you saw John telling us how they did the nail strips. Well, the nail strips get put all the way around the edge of the door panel. So as the nail strips are installed, they're put on the cardboard. Then the vinyl has to be pulled over and these jagged points are pushed back and that's what holds the vinyl tight. We really suggest that you have us do this job. We've done thousands of nail strip installations and it gets extremely difficult when you're trying to go around these corners and keep the material looking nice and tight. This is a 1960-61 Monza door panel with the Mylar.
1962 door panel before the binding has been put around the edge. This has the wide strip of mylar. 1963 door panel, a 1964 door panel, and this door panel includes the map pocket. 1965 door panel, this one will include the map pocket, but right now the map pocket hasn't been sewn on. The 65 door panel is the most intricate, and we'll take a look at the tooling out back. This is a 1966 door panel, also 67, and this would be a 1968-69. This one's actually more difficult to produce than the 65 because most of the complexity of the 65 is just done by the tooling. In this case on the 68 we have to put a lot of different materials in to get the correct loft to it. This next room has our dielectric embosser that was specially made just for us in the mid 80s. This is what puts the pleats into the interior and seals the panels to the door panels. These shelves have all our tooling for doing the dielectric sealing. We estimate that the tooling on these three shelves would be about half a million dollars to replace. This is the tooling for doing just the front door on a 1965. In certain places they have to be machined so that we have the corner effects. The thinner rule can be bent. This is a close-up of the brass rule. It's about an eighth of an inch wide. It's a fake stitch engraved in reverse on the brass. This machine allows us to take rolls of vinyl, put it on it, and slice them like we were slicing bologna. Lori's demonstrating how we put our fabrics together to make the interior inserts. Usually it takes two, three, or four different materials, so we've devised these stands that allows the different materials to be on here. She can pull it through our guillotine knife out to whatever length she needs, use the knife, cut it, and then we have all set to go our three different layers of fabric. So now we know how Tim got these three pieces of fabric that he needs. Tim, go ahead and load up your tooling. I've been told that when General Motors did this, they had a large table that was about 12 feet in diameter, and the table went under the dielectric embosser, and there would be many people loading and unloading it so that it was a continuous operation. So the tooling with the material on it gets shoved under the machine and this machine can create up to 30 tons of pressure. Then we have three timers and the different timers, the top one comes down and puts pressure. The middle one then actually allows the microwaves to be projected down, they go down to the brass rule and they're reflected back up. They do this thousands of times a second and that's what actually creates the heat in the vinyl. Because the machine is fairly noisy we didn't actually show it running but this is the way the finished product would come out. You can immediately lift it up and the pattern is all embossed right into there. The materials have actually heated, they've actually fused together. I hope this has given you a little better understanding of the amount of work that's necessary to produce door panels, interiors, top boots, headliners, and by all means if you're ever in our area please stop by and we'd be glad to give you a live tour. Every other year we also have our Clark Show.